Uh, this is 4th of July. Well, it's not the 4th, but if you're watching on video, it's coming up this week, and it's a time when our nation celebrates freedom. It's uh, the time that we signed a document of declaration, perhaps, of, uh, of independence to say that we believe in freedom, and we have believed in freedom, and many have fought for that freedom, and I, for one, am grateful for that freedom, and I know that you are as well. But even in the context of that freedom, there are those who can be critical. It's an interesting place to live, but we enjoy that freedom. And yet, those of us who follow Christ still find ourselves oddly kind of out of place wherever we go because in a sense, we are citizens of heaven. And as one pastor used to say, we are resident aliens. We're passing through. We're heading someplace where our citizenship is, the city of God. But in the meantime, as we travel, as we sojourn this land, we have a, we have a job to do. We have a, a place in this world. We have a purpose in this world for those of us who follow hard after Christ. And today, we're going to be looking at what that means. We've been talking about cartoon theology. It is a, a, a sketchy attempt to deal with subjects that are difficult. We started talking about the Trinity. That's an easy subject. Yeah, no problem there. But we dealt with the fact that, that, that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. You can't have God without all three, yet it's difficult to understand how all three are one, and yet it's true. You can't deny it when you read the Bible. It's evident throughout. The early church fathers called that the holy dance, those three interacting on, on a constant basis. And, and we, we talked about the, also the fact that because of that, and we are created in his image, we, Imago Dei, created in his image, are created for relationship just like God is in relationship. As the Father cannot be explained without explaining the Son and the Spirit, and the Son can't be explained without explaining the Spirit and the Father and the you know what I'm saying. We cannot be explained apart from each other. We are designed to live in relationship with one another. If you don't believe that, just take a look at the book of First John. You cannot get through with that book without realizing that it is the fellowship of believers and the cleansing of the blood of the Son that goes hand in hand. We're designed for relationship with God and we're designed for relationship with one another. And so as we think about that, we, we've talked about that and, 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 the, and the trustworthiness of the Word of God. But my question is now, as we, as we talk about cartoon theology, theology is that word that is made up of two Greek words, theo and logos, th God, talk. If you've ever talked to someone about God, you are a theologian. Whether you're a good theologian, I don't know. But if you've talked to anybody about God, you're a theologian. So the, the quest here is to make sure that we as Christ followers are thinking theologically. So that when the winds of doctrine and philosophy and culture blow to and fro, we stand firm knowing who we are in him. So when we get to this, it's real easy to talk about the Trinity. It's easy to talk about the Word. These are kind of abstract, abstract subjects. But, but the, we're, we're getting down to where the rubber meets the road, and that is this. Because of this, because of what Christ has done for me, who am I as a result of that, and how do I live towards you? H how do I do that? There's a great story found in, in 1 Samuel chapter uh, 22. If you, if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to read there or turn there with me. We're going to read it in just a moment. Um, but let me tell you the story as, as you're getting ready for it. Uh, David, who is about uh, in a few years to become king of Israel, uh, is not yet king. He has uh, risen in the ranks of Saul, King Saul's army. Uh, words are beginning to be spoken among the people Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his tens of thousands. And Saul, King Saul, began to get jealous of David. And so he began to look for an opportunity to kill David to get rid of the threat. 
And when David heard this, he, he lit out and started hiding in various places throughout the, the land to stay just, just far enough away from Saul. The story that we're about to read takes place actually in a cave of hiding for him. As we think about this, David is a man of refuge. He knows that God is his refuge. He is a man who is clearly dependent on God. But he has taken this relationship that he has with God and he has transferred it to the way he relates to others. How do I know this? Check it out. 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. So David left Goth, where he had been hiding before, and escaped to the cave of Adalam. Soon his brothers and his other relatives joined him there. Then others began coming. Men who were in trouble or in debt or, were, or who were just discontented until David was the captain of about 400 men. Let's just stop reading right there. In a few chapters, those 400 become 600. Um, if you're going to hang out in a, in a cave, um, 600 men is a lot of men to hang out in a cave. Um, if it's a hot day, um, yeah, well, okay, you can picture that. David's in hiding. And 400 very broken people come and join him. When I read this story for the first time, in fact, first service this morning, I looked back halfway through my sermon, and, and, and David and Carolyn Roper were sitting on the back um, row, and uh, he just drops into various churches throughout the valley, he, he encourages us pastors, and, uh, and I reminded him after the service this morning, I said, David, you remember that, that you're the one that, uh, sitting at Applebee's on Eagle Road one time, that pointed me to this, because I kept using the word refuge. And he said, Jim, you need to look at this story, and, and that's the, the rest is history. And as I looked at this story, I began to realize, why in the world would 400 men come and join David? Some of these men were family and relatives, so they knew him. But some of these men, other men, it, it is suggested by some that it, they were perhaps fellow soldiers with him who fought under Saul. They were men who already trusted David. They knew something about David. There was something trustworthy about him. So they gathered with him, and he became their captain, their leader. They looked to him to lead. But look at these men. The first one is, is it says they were in distress. That word is matzok in the Hebrew. It doesn't just mean kind of depressed. It means literally to be figuratively, literally to be figuratively, it means figuratively to be squeezed into a narrow place. It's, it's what we call be, being between a rock and a hard place. Anybody ever been there? You're squeezed in, you can't move to the right, you can't move to the left, you can't go back, you can't go forward. You don't know what's coming next. You're saying, God, please, just show me what, what's coming next. But you can't, you, you're not hearing anything. That's matzok, in distress. The second one is that they were in debt. Nasha is the Hebrew word there. And you don't have to write all this down. It's in that little bulletin insert this morning. And you can, that's, we're giving you those so you have time to process this throughout the week and, 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 and just examine your own life in light of the, the scripture that we're talking about. But the word nasha here is, is to be in debt. But it's not just like, oh, you know, I, I'm a little bit in debt because I made some bad choices. This literally is, it means a debt that does not come from a lack of self-discipline, but rather a debt that comes from being beguiled, deceived, led astray by those in authority. Helplessness. Where the government gets bigger and more oppressive. The taxation rate at this time was far greater than what we experience here in America. There were those who were losing family land because they couldn't pay their bills. There was a, uh, this suffocating feeling of not only am I not going to ever get out of this, but I feel like I'm being closed in and I can't do anything about it. No hope. That third one is discontented, discontented, mar nefesh, which means a deep, bitter grief in the depths of the soul. It is an utter hopelessness. It's not just like, well, I'm kind of depressed. 
it's at that point where, you know, David, if you don't offer me some hope, I'm probably going to end it. I've tried everything. Nothing works. My relationships have gone south. My hope is lost. Unless you can give me a reason to live, I'm done. Now that's a pretty rough group of people. I've heard people say before, you know, I don't, I don't go to church because uh, I, I, don't, I don't like church. I've been hurt by the church. I understand that. And sometimes, in fact, we can be hurt by the church. But the church is people who are not perfect. In fact, if anything, if you look at these descript this description of the people who come into the cave, it doesn't look a whole lot different than the church. Beat up by life, broken, hopeless, and we've come and we've found hope, we've found forgiveness, we've found a reason for living. I don't know who you are or where you were before you met Jesus. But apart from Christ, I had nothing worth living for. And I'm still not perfect. <laughs> and my hunch is neither are you. And we're in process. But sometimes the church looks like this cave. You see, the first time I read this story, I thought, wow, what a metaphor. It's a metaphor of what the church ought to look like. Here's the cartoon for this week. It's, it's this picture of coming in to the cave of refuge. If you go to this very place where David uh, and his men hid out, you will find that, that there's several Hebrew names they give this area, but one of them is simply this, the caves of refuge where David and his men hid from Saul. And, and if that was just the end of the story, it would be kind of hopeful, but fairly depressing. The good news is, is this is not the end of the story. They were in dire straits. They were deceived. They were embittered. But something happened in that cave because they didn't stay in the cave. Nobody ever st stopped in the cave and said, you know, we've been here for about six months, David, and... Uh, I feel safe, I feel comfortable, I, I think we ought to paint the place. Some curtains over there, maybe a little carpet, let's just make it comfortable. Never. You see, they left this cave. Something happened inside that cave because they were being transformed, but they had been transformed and they partnered with God. This week we're just going to talk about refuge and transformation. But, but first of all, I want to talk about David. He, he was a person of refuge. He was a person who understood the mercy of God. It was David who said, if he counts our sins against us, who can stand? He understood who he was and who he wasn't. There was a humility about David, an understanding of who he was in Christ. Oh, I've met people before who say, you know, I, I, I don't, really feel like I'm that bad of a person. I, I hope that when I die and get to heaven, there's a big assumption, <laughs> that the good things I've done will outweigh the bad. Let me know how that works out for you. Because if that's our hope, I'm toast. Because Jesus said something about, it's not just the actions, but if you do it in your mind, it's actually the action. Do you know how many people I've punched? <laughs> do you know how many people I've killed and buried out in the Owyhees? Can I, how about I just stop right there? Really? The good that I've done outweighing the bad? I don't think so. I'm hopeless, apart from the blood of Christ, who cleanses us from all unrighteousness. 
Our righteousness is not our act. It is Christ's act on our behalf. It's what he did on the cross, taking our penalty, death. Because the wages of sin is death. He took it upon himself on our behalf. And God raised him from the dead, which means not only can we be forgiven, but we too can be raised from the dead just like him. Not because of anything we've done, but because of his grace. But that's mercy, you guys. That's mercy. I don't deserve that. You don't deserve that. That's mercy. David was a man of mercy. He was a man of refuge. And because of that, these men became that way. Jesus was that way. Jesus was a man who accepted people. I, was a, I, I was a, had the opportunity to sit down uh, and have lunch with a man named Dr. Robert Coleman. Uh, if I would have said that word 30 years ago, most of you would say, oh, wow, I know who that is. Most of you probably today are saying, so, okay. 30 years ago, uh, but still to this day, he's still preaching, but he traveled with Billy Graham. He was a professor. He was a, 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 a prolific writer. He wrote one of the most widely read and widely translated books on evangelism of all time called The Master Plan of Evangelism. I had the opportunity to sit down at, to dinner with him about four years ago, and I did not want to waste this opportunity. This was a man who had seen the world, he had traveled with Billy Graham, and, and had just seen just about everything. And so I said, Dr. Coleman, I have a question for you. I said, you travel all throughout the land and specifically in America, what is the one thing that when you show up, you say to yourself, mm, I just wish they would get this. And without even blinking, he said, acceptance of other people. I said, what? He said, I don't believe the church is very good at accepting people. You see, sometimes I think we're afraid that the word acceptance means approval. Jesus accepted everyone. Did he approve of every, every sin? No. In fact, when, G, when people came to him, he loved them. He forgave them. He cleansed them. He changed them. And what did he always end up with by saying? Go and sin no more. Sin is a horrible thing. We've talked about it. Hebrew, in Hebrew, sin means to turn in on self. It means I'm not, no longer connected to God. I'm no longer connected to you. I'm all about me. That's sin. And we're created for relationship with him and relationship with one another. So if I'm turning in on myself, that's sin. Jesus says sin's a bad idea. It separates us from God. It separates us from one another. Jesus accepted people. He didn't approve of sin. So many times I think that people within the church are all about this, this differentiation. And because we don't approve of this or we don't approve of that, that's what we focus on and we're wagging our finger at the world. Why are we shocked that people who aren't Christians don't act like Christians? We ought to, first of all, focus on making sure that those who call themselves Christians act like Christians. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> but I'll quit meddling and go back to preaching. Okay. Jesus was accepting. Jesus told the story in Matthew 18 of the unforgiving servant. The un, it, it, it basically... A man owed a, a, a king or a ruler about a million bucks. And the ruler brought him in and said, hey, where's that money you owe me? He says, oh, well, I'm, I'm working hard. Uh, give me more time. Give me more time. I beg of you. Give me mercy. And, the, and finally the king says, you know what? i tell you what. I'm going to do you one better. I'm just going to forgive the whole debt. Wouldn't it be great if you got a phone call today? Somebody said, how much do you owe on your mortgage? How about your cars? Okay, good. All right, how about school bills? Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. i tell you what. I'm going to write you a check for all of that. That's the point you do the happy dance. <laughs> wow. What? You think this guy would have thought, man, what amazing mercy. So the story is told, Jesus says, is he goes out and he finds a guy who owes him, owes him 10 bucks. He says, hey, where's that 10 bucks you owe me? The guy says, oh man, I, I'm trying to get it back to you. I, I'm working hard. Give me more time. He says, no. I'm going to throw you in jail till you pay it back. And some of the people who had seen the first thing happen saw the second thing happen. They went back to the king and said, did you know what just happened? So the king called the man back and it got ugly after that. 
And Jesus told the story to tell us this. If you have been shown mercy, who in the world do you think you are to not demonstrate that same mercy to others? A person of refuge, first of all, understands mercy. And a person of refuge shows mercy. David did that. And these men experienced that. And they were transformed as a result. David inspired them. He, he taught them what it was like to, to, to really have a relationship with God. This is a picture of the actual site. Um, again, I, I, I can't say that I know for sure that David was in this particular cave, but in this area. And these are the series of caves. This is the, one of the biggest ones. And so I'm, 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 making, I'm conjecturing here. Uh, but my hunch is, is that even though it doesn't look that big, if you actually step just over those rocks and look down inside, you'll see that it gets quite big down inside. And, and, and if, in the back behind there, you'll see some little holes. And those are like wormhole tunnels kind of cut back through the rocks that open up into bigger rooms. I don't know how those guys got back there. I'm sure that they were much more muscular than I am. <clears throat> yes. Um, but I have a hunch that maybe they were a little bit smaller in statue because as I tried to squeeze my way through there, if it weren't for the fact that I was sweating and greased up, I wouldn't have been able to get through. I had students pushing me and somebody pulling me, and I got through. It was great. But it was tight, and uh, it was an amazing thing to see and imagine this happening there. And the word transformation here is what we're focused on. We have actually... One psalm that we know was written from this cave. And it's Psalm 57. And if we're going to have any hint as to what David taught these men, it would be found right here. Let me read it to you. Maybe you'd like to read along, but maybe you'd just like to look at that cave. Imagine yourself hearing these words of David as one of those 400 men in distress, in debt, and discontented. See if these words bring hope to you. These are the things that David taught them. Psalm 57, have mercy on me, O God. O God, have mercy. Isn't that interesting? He starts with mercy. David was a man who understood mercy. I look to you for protection. I will hide beneath the shadow of your wings until the danger passes by. I cry out to God most high, to God who will fulfill his purpose for me. Hmm. He will send help from heaven to rescue me, disgracing those who hound me. My God will send forth his unfailing love and, unfa and, and faithfulness. I am surrounded by fierce lions who greedily devour human prey, whose teeth pierce like spears and arrows and whose tongues cut like swords. Be exalted, O God. Above the highest heavens, may your glory shine over all the earth. My enemies have set a trap for me. I'm weary from distress. They've dug a pit in my path, but they themselves have fallen into it. My heart is confident in you, O God. My heart is confident. No wonder I can sing your praises. Wake up, O my heart. Wake up, O lyre and harp. I will awake the dawn with my song. I will thank you, Lord, among all the people. I'll sing your praises among the nations. You've got to get out of the cave to do that. He knew he wasn't stuck there. For your unfailing love is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the highest heavens. May your glory shine over all the earth. In that bulletin insert this morning, those five uh, main things that he teaches them, which was part of their transformation, is found. And that's for you to, to spend time and reflect on. But, but David basically started off with reminding them that God had mercy and he loved them. And let me, let me just say that if you haven't heard me say that, by the way, today, God's crazy about you. 
You, you heard Jeremy's prayer this morning in that sense that this morning there's someone who doesn't believe that. Let me tell you something. If you don't believe that, you haven't been reading your Bible because if you've been reading your Bible, you'll find that that's not the way God is. God is a God of love. He is a God who has deep affection for us. And our prayer, my prayer, is that you and I would be seized by his great affection. And I can't do that. I can't learn that. I can only be the recipient of that. He taught his men that God loved them. He taught them that God's purposes included them. He taught them that God's kingdom will come on earth. He taught them that worship is essential. How many times have you dragged yourself in here on a Sunday morning just weary from the week and about two songs in your heart begins to change? And it's in the context of worship that we begin to remember, oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. You're in charge, Lord. He also told them it was, there was a time coming when they were going to have to leave the cave in order to proclaim the kingdom of God. And you see, caves aren't designed to live in forever. If the church of today is to be a cave that needs to be a place of refuge where God's love can be found. It needs to be filled with people of refuge. Let me, let me say this right now. You don't have a church of refuge because you study the scripture. You don't have a church of refuge unless it's filled with people of refuge. And if you've got people of refuge, you've automatically got a church of refuge. Because we are people who understand mercy and who show mercy. That's the ticket. David was that way. And these men were being transformed as they watched this in his life. As they allowed God to do his maturing work in them. Some people say, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm just not religious. I understand that there's such thing as dead religion. I get that. I get that. I'm not critical of those who say, I can't stand dead religion. Okay, but, but religion is not a dirty word. Religion is the form in which we, we go about operating this organism called the church. And the fact of the matter is, this thing called the church is filled with people. It's you and me. And, and, and I, I can't say that I love Jesus, but I can't stand his people. Now, now I understand. Uh, if you know my story at all, I, I left the ministry for three years. I was a pastor. In California, I left. I had no desire to ever pastor a church again. There were some things I blamed on the church that later I realized were things that God was trying to point out about me. And it took me some time. I understand pain that comes from the church. I understand that we're not perfect. I understand that we're in process. I understand that you can be hurt and I can be hurt by those within the body of Christ. But I can't say to this church, who is also, by the way, called the bride of Christ, hey, Jesus, I love you. I think you're great. I think you're perfect. I want to follow you, but I can't stand your choice in women. Would you tell your best friend, I love you, but your fiance stinks. No, if you really love the groom, can you trust that maybe he sees something you don't? And the Bible says that we will be presented without spot or wrinkle. And there's coming a wedding day and this old girl, this old girl is going to walk through those gates. And the groom, who's been waiting for her, is going to drop his jaw. And there's going to be a wedding. He must see something we don't. We're not free to say I can't stand the church. The church is the bride of Christ. I need you. You need me. We sharpen each other. We mentor one another. 
We grow as a result of walking this walk together. It's not just Jesus and me on the Jericho Road. I don't know who wrote that song. It's a cool country song, but it's really dumb. <laughs> Sorry. If that's your favorite song, you're just going to have to find a new favorite. Sorry. I, it's not just Jesus and me. It's Jesus and me and you and you and you and you. It's all of us. We're designed for a relationship with him and relationship with one another. Wow. That's where transformation takes place. I had this thought this week. Oh, man, I'm running out of time. One of those times when you read a scripture that you know you've read a million times, all of a sudden you read it and you go, oh, wow, where did this come from? 2 Timothy uh, 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 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of what? Fear and timidity, but he has given us a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. I never liked that verse because of that last word in the whole verse, self-discipline. Um, <laughs> somebody asked me what I was doing for Lent. I said, I'm giving up self-discipline. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Where's, where's a rim shot when you need it? Um, <sighs> I've read this verse. I've, I've got it underlined. I've got, verse, I've got things written next to it. But all of a sudden, it occurred to me this week, as I was heading down south to talk uh, to some pastors in California about some stuff that was kind of difficult. Uh, and, and I was just trying to listen to the Lord and, and, and make sure that my heart was in the right spot to, to, to make sure that I was you know, not just operating in my own strength. And I was reading this verse, and it just occurred to me that the Holy Spirit has given me these things. He's given me power. He's given me love. He's given me self-discipline. He's not given me a, a, a spirit of fear. In other words, timidity, which is, is a cowering fear out of, uh, from, from a, it's, it's a wrong view of God. There's such thing as a holy fear. There's a such thing as a, as a godly fear because we recognize though we're able to come boldly to the throne of grace, we come boldly but still a little trembly because we realize we're coming into the very presence of the God of uh, creation. There's a holy fear, that's okay, but not an unholy fear, an ungodly fear, fear that God is somehow this cosmic killjoy who's ready to hit me every time I do something wrong. That's not the God of the Bible. So I've got this holy fear, but not an improper fear. And what he's also given to me is this. He's given me power. He's given me love. He's given me self-discipline. So all of a sudden it occurs to me, if I don't have power in my life, it's not because he hasn't given it to me. If I don't have love in my life, if my life doesn't look loving, it's not because he hasn't given it to me. If I don't have self-discipline in my life, it's not because he hasn't given it to me. So if he's given it to me, why don't I have it? Apparently I haven't used it. Let me, let me, let me illustrate this. This is my water. It's Jim's special water. It says Arrowhead, but it means Jim. Uh, they, they supply me with water because I get dry mouth. And so I drink to keep myself going. This is very special to me. This, I need this water. This is my water. I get my own water box. Nobody's supposed to take any water. That's my water box. So I always know there's water there. Jeremy, yeah. I'd like to give you my water. Really? Yeah. That's my water now. No, mine, no. But yeah, it's, you're right. It's yours. I gave it to you. Yeah. yeah. This is awesome. <laughs> That's special water there. Holy. <laughs> Holy water. Wow. You know, I think I, I you know what I could do with this? I what? could put it in my office, like on my shelf. Wow. Yeah. Holy water from Jim. Wow. It'd be good for all. You come in and you can look at it in my office. Huh. You know? That's not why I gave it to you. Uh, you're supposed to drink it? <laughs> you're supposed to drink it. That's a good idea. It's good water. Really good water. I told you. It's, yeah. a, it's the best. <laughs> it is. Holy gym water. <laughs> Stop now. <laughs> it occurred to me all of a sudden that the Holy Spirit gives us all kinds of gifts. But if I don't see evidence of those things happening in my life, it's because I never unscrewed the cap and drank. I've just got all the gifts of the Holy Spirit sitting up on my shelf going, <laughs> look at those gifts, aren't they great? And he's saying, when are you going to open them? 
When are you going to unscrew the, the lid and, and let power into your life? If I'm not living in power, I'm, I'm, I'm probably living with shame, and I'm probably living with guilt, and I'm probably living with unconfessed sin, and I'm probably living with the, the, the results of abuse in my life, and I'm probably living with self-doubt. If I don't have the power, dunamis is the Greek word there. If I don't, that's where we get dynamite, by the way. If I don't have that in my life, it's not because the Holy Spirit hasn't given it. It's because I never unscrewed the cap and drank it. I've got it sitting on my shelf. If there's not love in my life, let me tell you something, guys. We are called to love. If people know me by my critical spirit, there's something wrong if I call myself a Jesus follower. When you show up into a room, do people go, wow, he's here, she's here? Or do they go, Oh no, there goes all the oxygen out of the room. <laughs> what about your life is good news? If the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news, what about your life? What about my life is good news? If there's not love in my life, it's not because the Holy Spirit hasn't given it to me, it's because I haven't unscrewed the cap and taken a drink. And that's the love that transforms. Let me tell you something too about self-discipline, wow. That, that just doesn't seem right, does it? The word self-discipline means self-discipline. There, there are people in this world that have natural self-discipline. I can't stand them. <laughs> but isn't it interesting that the Holy Spirit has given us self-discipline? So in other words, if there's not self-discipline in my life, it's not because... He hasn't done his part. It's because I haven't unscrewed the cap and taken a drink of it. I haven't allowed his transforming power to work in and through my life. I got a holy hunch that you, like me, are struggling with at least one of these three areas. And the question is this. Not have you received from the Holy Spirit. Have you unscrewed the cap and taken a drink? Have you allowed the Spirit to actually change you from the inside out? Am I receiving what He has for me? I'll tell you what, right now, we're never going to be people of, of refuge if we don't understand His love, if we're not becoming people of refuge. It'll never happen. If I don't have power and love and self discipline, coming from my life. It's because I'm not allowing the Spirit who has already given me everything I need to actually seep into my life and change me. These men, by the way, these three D people, I call them, distressed, discontented, and in debt, they become David's mighty men, the greatest fighting force Israel has ever known. What in the world happened in that cave that turned refugees into warriors? That wasn't David who did it. That was God who did it. And the same God who oversees this refuge is still able to make that kind of a transformation in my life and yours. I don't care if you're a refugee. I don't care if you're broken. I don't care if you're in need of healing. Today, the good news of the gospel is this that you can be forgiven and understand mercy. You can reciprocate that mercy. You can have everything you need from the Holy Spirit of God to actually be changed from the inside out. 2 Corinthians 3.18 tells us that we are being transformed into his likeness. Is it happening in your life? Do you see evidence of it? I'm gonna ask you a favor. This morning as I say these words, some of you might be thinking, you know, I don't know what that mercy is. I, I, I want to experience that mercy because I'm tired. I, I don't know what to do with it. I, I, I've been trying to do it on my own. I was hoping the, the good things I did in life would outweigh the bad, but I'm starting to feel like I'm getting, I'm losing the race. And I'm, now, I, now that you talk about it, I'm starting to think that even some of those things that I thought were good are not so good, and oh no. The good news is, if you confess your sins, 
He is faithful and just, and he will forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You can't earn that. You can't buy that. That's free. That's good news. I don't know about you, but that's good news to me. But some of you are saying, you know, preacher, I, I've been saved, and, and I believe that the Holy Spirit has given me gifts. Great. But let me ask you a question. Are the gifts sitting on the shelf, or have you unscrewed the cap and begun to drink? Because that's what changes you and me. We need to be people of refuge, you guys. But we'll never be people of refuge if we're not transformed by the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you what, we'll never be a church of refuge unless it's filled with people of refuge. Theologically, that's how we are to live towards God and others, and especially right here. So as I say that this morning, I'm going to ask Jeremy to come and pray. And I'm going to ask you for the privilege that if today you want to receive either forgiveness or you want to receive mercy or you want to receive the Spirit or you want to just simply say, Lord, I thank you for those things you've already given. I just want to let the water, the living water, flow through my body today and begin to change me from the inside out. I'm going to ask for the privilege of being able to pray for you. And Jeremy will lead you in that after we sing this song. But make this song a prayer. And I'm going to go and prepare for baptism right now. But let's pray this song. So this morning as we um, respond, I'm just going to ask as you, uh, if you would, if you just close your eyes with me this morning, reflect on what the Holy Spirit has spoken to you. And if you would like, sometimes just the posture of saying, I want to receive is simply just opening your hands up. It's just a, just a sign of just saying, I want to receive what you have for me. Sometimes our posture even can just do something in our own heart where we're saying, God, I want to receive what you have for me. So Holy Spirit, we know that you're already here. We know that you're working. We know that you're drawing people, but we invite you afresh and anew to come. And it's a posture of our hearts to receive what you have for us. And so we, with open hands, ask you to come. Because we want to drink deeply from you, Holy Spirit. 
And so we invite you. And Holy Spirit, we ask that um, for those of us in our own lives, Lord, who, who read this verse in Timothy and, and we say, yeah, yes, we want to receive power and love and self-discipline, but we've never actually invited you in to do that. We, this morning, invite you into our hearts. Lord, we want to see you operate in our lives in power. God, we want to see you move. We want to have encounters with you. Lord, we want our lives to be changed. And so, Father, we ask, Lord, that for those of us that are here that just need to receive your spirit and your power in our lives, Lord, would you come and would you do that afresh and anew? And Lord, for those of us that are here this morning and we need to just receive your love, we need to just let it wash over us so that we can be people who love others. We need to let it just, just drop all over us so that we're changed in the process that we can love others better. Holy Spirit, we invite you to do that. Lord, we invite you to, to just come and into our hearts and teach us how to love. And we, with open hands, just say yes to that. And Lord, for those of us who struggle with self-discipline in whatever area it might be, we invite a fresh anointing of your spirit into our lives right now. Lord, you've given us the spirit of self-discipline. We can't do it on our own. But we drink deeply from you this morning and say, Holy Spirit, we receive the ability to break cycles in our lives because of who you are. We receive, Father, the power of the Holy Spirit that we're not uh, always told that this is how we're going to be because we fall in this area or because we struggle in this area. But by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, we receive the ability to have freedom and to walk in newness of life by the power of your Holy Spirit. So Lord, we're here this morning because we want to receive from you. We, we want what you have for us, and so we would just open hands just as a gesture to you saying, God, we want all that you have for us. We want everything that you want to give us. But Father, we don't want to walk out of here saying we don't have those things because we haven't opened ourselves to you and received them and opened ourselves to you and drank deeply of who you are. So Holy Spirit, would you continue to work in our hearts and in our lives? And Father, as we celebrate baptism and we celebrate, Lord, new life and redeemed life and life that's set free, Lord, we know that it's all a result of the power and work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so for you, we give, for that we give glory and honor, and we say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. As Jim says, it is a privilege uh, to, to be able to pray with you. And um, we're going to now uh, celebrate uh, baptism. So we're going to move a few things out of the way. And I'm going to make my way back here and put this mic in over here so I don't let you get anybody. Danny and Zachary Trevette are going to be baptized today, dad and son. And uh, I'm going to let dad, come on in, guys. I'm going to let dad uh, speak on behalf of Zachary. I've talked to Zachary already, and uh, he understands what he's doing here today. But uh, I'm going to let dad... Uh, <laughs> It's, it feels cold right now, but uh, I'm going to let Dad explain uh, why uh, Zachary is also going to be baptized, and then um, uh, we'll we'll baptize Danny, the dad. So, t why are, why are you here, why are you guys here today? Can you tell us, Danny? Yeah, uh, Zachary and I are here today to pledge our our courtship with Jesus Christ, and that we're here to make that union and show that we're here with Jesus and God and Holy Spirit and that we want to devote our life to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I like the way that you use the word courtship. We just talked about the, the body of Christ being the bride of Christ and that's exactly what it is. It's an, it's an engagement yes. and there's a wedding day coming. That's awesome. 
But we're going we're gonna, to, um, I've talked to Zachary this morning. He understands exactly that Jesus is his Savior. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to baptize him if he doesn't baptize himself first here. So, um, so buddy, come right on over here and hold your nose. Okay. And Zachary Trevette, I'm going to now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because you desire to follow after Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Okay. So Danny, you go ahead there. And... Can I read my... Oh, yes, absolutely. Go right ahead. Um, you can step right up close oh, to the mic. Don't touch it. But yeah. 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 This is a passage that's um, close to my heart. I mean, I, I feel that the vines brought me to Idaho and to the um, crossroads. Um, it's James 15. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do, that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Amen. 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 Danny Trevette, because of your faith in Jesus Christ and your desire to walk with him, to be one with Jesus, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you, brother. Okay. We are simply recipients of all that God has for us, and we are privileged to be his people. And as we've prayed, and thank you for your prayer, Jeremy, as we've prayed, as we've reflected on the word today, I just want to remind you of this one thing, that he is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or even imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church, both now and evermore. And all of God's people said, God bless you.